Okay, I'm gonna gavel in. Clerk, please take the roll. Chair Mariani, excuse. Vice Chair Frazier. Present. Rep uh, Lee Johnson. You know what I mean. Present. Uh, Representative Edelson. Representative Edelson. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Hollins. Representative Hollins. I see she's still connecting to audio. Representative Hewitt. Here. Representative Cleveborn. Cleveborn present. Representative Long. Representative Long. Representative Lucero. Double duty with Commerce Committee this morning. Representative Mueller. Mueller present. Representative Navani. Navani present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill present. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Poston. Poston present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh present. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Shong. Here. Representative Edelson. Representative Hollins. Collins present. Representative Long. I will, I'll note that uh, President Long and Representative Edelson are excused from today's hearing. Chair Frazier, that concludes roll call. A quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, do we have minutes for March 24th that we need to move? Uh, mm -hmm. Lee Johnson, have you had a moment to, have you had a chance to see those minutes for March 24th? Yes, I did. Would you like to make a motion to move those minutes? I will do that. Thank you, Lee Johnson. Would a vote void suffice? That will be fine. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Thank you, those minutes are accepted. Well, committee, I don't have a, I know the chair usually does a theme. We don't have a theme today. Um, and unfortunately, the chair is absent due to an unexpected conflict, so I'll be handling the gavel duties today. Today, we will be hearing department budget presentations from the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission, um, our post board, and our private detectives board um, as well. And we're going to get started with testifiers from the Minnesota uh, Commission's, uh, I mean, Commission's guidelines. And first up, we have Nate Reitz, Executive Director of the Minnesota Tennessee Guideline Commission. Mr. Reitz, please come forward, uh, state your name for the record and begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nate Reitz and I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, so this, this is a, about the supplemental budget request. The, the governor does not have a supplemental budget request for the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. We were fully funded for the current biennium. So, so really there is no, um, there is no budget request to present to you today. So I, I could be done, uh, but, but I will say this. I, I, uh, I was challenged by my chair a couple of weeks ago to think about what we could do if we did have more resources. And I don't want to turn this into a, a backdoor budget request because we don't have a budget request for you. Uh, but, but I think it is interesting to sometimes think about, you know, what's within the scope of what you could do and, and what are you doing and, and what could you be doing? And some of this goes to what you asked uh, the last time we met, Mr. Chair. Uh, you, you asked me, uh, you know, whether a, a particular uh, topic was within the scope of of what the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission could do. Um, and and really, there's a two part answer to that. Well, maybe a three part answer to that. One is what's within the scope of our mission. So I I think the scope of our mission is very broad. Um, and, and I'm particularly, I'm, I'm kind of setting aside the, the policy side of, of what the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission does. That's really within the, the scope of, of the, the 11 members who are appointed by the Chief Justice and the Governor. Um, I, I'm really more looking at uh, the, the clearinghouse and information center role that the, that the 1978 legislature gave the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission when it created the first uh, sentencing guidelines uh, commission in the nation in 1978. And um, 
and, and it's a pretty broad, um, pretty broad role as I read it. it. It has a very specific mission with respect to being the clearinghouse and information center for sentencing practices within the state of Minnesota. And, and as far as that goes, we do that and we do it very well. I am not a national expert on, uh, you know, sentencing data, uh, but, but I have spoken to a number of national experts who are, and they consistently heap praise on the quality of Minnesota's sentencing data. And that's really because the legislature had the foresight to create the, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, I, I know of some research studies that have been done in Minnesota just because that's where the best data was. Uh, and, and, uh, and we do have good sentencing practices data. We can tell you a lot about what happens at the initial felony sentencing event. Um, and, and we provide that data and reports to you and, and, it, and it, it's helpful and interesting. And I think, it, uh, I think it's valuable to policymakers such as yourselves. And, and it's solely because you, the legislature created us to, to, uh, to be an agency for that data. But there's a lot of questions that aren't answered. And I think those questions are, at least as I read, as I read our mission within the scope of it, uh, it, it talks about, in addition to being a, a clearinghouse and information center on the collection, preparation, analysis, and dissemination of information on state and local sentencing practices, uh, there's also, uh, we're supposed to look at use of imprisonment and alternatives to imprisonment, plea bargaining, and other matters relating to the improvement of the criminal justice system, which is very broad. I mean, even just looking at the, the topic of plea bargaining, there's a lot there, Mr. Chair, in, in the topic of plea bargaining to, to really look at how plea bargaining occurs in the 87 counties in our great state. We would have to know uh, a, a lot of information. We'd have to know about what the underlying offense was that was committed, which would require us presumably to get into police report data. Now, there, there, is, a, there is a lot of data that police are required to forward on. Um, and But my understanding is that is a, a, an incident-based system, and we'd have to somehow convert that into a case-based system. So how would we do that? I, I don't really know. Um, and uh, we, we'd have to know about uh, charging practices and plea bargaining practices. We'd have to get into law enforcement data. I, and, I mean, not just law enforcement data, but also prosecutor data. Um, and, and is that even possible? What, what are the data silos that the 87 different county attorneys have. Um, we don't necessarily know that. And, and I will say, not to get ahead of ourselves, but uh, I, I did peek ahead at, at next Tuesday's agenda, and you are looking at a um, House File 1369, and, and the Delete All Amendment does create a task force on this, where, where we, would, we would kind of unpack some of these unknowns that I'm describing to you uh, regarding charging data. And, and, and that's that, those are just a couple of issues on the pre-sentence side that, that we, we know we don't know about. There are other, other questions, clearance rates, um, uh, dismissals and reasons for that, diversions, uh, stays of adjudication, uh, juvenile court information. We don't really track that unless it turns in a, into an adult case. Uh, we don't track juvenile court information. Uh, we don't track pre-sentence specialty courts. And I know that there are some some large uh, data protections around juvenile, uh, around pre-sentence specialty courts because, and post-sentence specialty courts because we're dealing with, with people in treatment. We're dealing with protected medical records. Is there any way we could access that information in a way that respected the privacy of the individuals involved and yet gave policymakers some information? Um, and and uh, what are the outcomes of, of these various issues? So that's that's all on the pre-sentence side. I know there's a lot of information that we don't know about that. And of course, there's the information I don't know that we don't know about that. So uh, th th there are a lot of unknowns there. And, and you know, we're just not in a position uh, resource-wise to be able to look at those things. We had, uh, we had a staff member who's, um, who wanted to move closer to family. So she, a, a research analyst, uh, uh, resigned last year to work for the Department of um, corrections in Colorado, and um, we were crippled basically with the loss of that one staff member. And due to the hiring freeze that was in place, we, we didn't have a research analyst in one position for for the entire year. And as a result, we were behind 
on our data collection. We didn't do any, uh, I don't think we did any demographic impact statements last year, which we typically do. Uh, so, so there's a lot of work we couldn't do just to maintain our status quo with just the loss of one position. So we're certainly not in a position to be able to move ahead on, on some of these issues. And I've just been describing the pre-sentence area. There's also the post-sentence area, which we also don't look at. That has to do with uh, particularly a, a probation uh, and but other forms of, of post-sentence uh, supervised release. Um, you know, possible data linkages there would be with the Department of Corrections, with the, um, uh, with the judicial branch. Uh, we do have data linkages with the judicial branch, but is there more information that we could get to follow up on, on uh, probation? We, we, what about, you know, violations? Are people being violated on technical violations? How many times uh, do they come before the court before they're finally sentenced to prison? Um, you know, are people being released from probation early? These are these are data points we just don't track. We don't have the resources to track, um, and we don't know what it would take to track these uh, these data points. Um, and and really, it what we could potentially do. And I and I appreciate my bosses, but the, the chairs asking me to to sort of think about these things because. Because it did let me think about, you know, the one question that we could answer, really two questions, uh, we could answer the, the who questions, right? Wh where are these practices happening? What, what are the, what are the, what are the, the uh, demographic characteristics of the people uh, who are getting these various practices? Where are these different practices happening? That sort of thing. But, but the other question, the, the, the really big question that we can't answer right now are what are the outcomes? Of all of these different practices, and I think I think if if there were an agency that were able to look at this this entire spectrum of pre-sentence, sentence, and post-sentence, not just sentencing, um, you know, we we might be able to answer some of the, these questions, particularly about outcomes. Um, so that's uh, that's a very long way, Mr. Chair, saying uh, we do not have a supplemental budget request. Director Ruggs, I, I appreciate that thorough way of you saying that you don't have a supplemental budget request. Um, but I, I mean, this information was, was helpful, at least I know for, for me it was, um, hearing what you, I always think it's important to know what you don't know, but also to understand there may be things that you need to find out um, that may be other things that you don't know, if I didn't bundle the way I said that. But I think, you know, with the task force, uh, that could really be a way, as, as you said, that could be a way to kind of unpack many of these things. And one of the things that I really heard, even though you're not asking for any supplemental budgets, what I heard you say is it likely we're gonna need resources to, to build capacity for you to be able to do the work that we may be asking you to do in the future. I, I think understanding a, the, you know, from pre-sentencing to sentencing to post-sentencing and understanding how all these things are working together and what those outcomes um, and tracking those outcomes is what we should know about our system. Uh, you just stated that you've spoken with people around the country and we have one of the top, maybe we have the model around the country. Um, but I think we maybe can, we may can also with putting these things together, be a leader uh, moving forward. And that's, I always want to make sure as Minnesotans, uh, we like to lead and I want to make sure that we do the things and have the resources in place to continue to lead and be the model for the rest of the country. Um, if, if any, do any members have any, I don't see any hands yet. Do any members have any questions for, or comments for the director? Rep. Clyborn. Thank you very much, Chair Frazier. And I would just like to say, I appreciate the forward thinking of um, what, what could we be doing better? And so I wanna thank you for the testimony today and for always keeping that in mind. And to be frank and honest about the needs of the state, the needs of the people and how we can constantly improve. So I just wanna say thank you again for your testimony today. Thank you, Representative Clay Warren. Um, any other questions for Director Wrights? Well, Director Wrights, that was, uh, even though it was a long way of saying you don't have a supplemental budget, it was still very quick. Do you have any closing comments and we'll let you be on your way? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanna say I, I did not, um, I, I talked about House File 1369. I don't, I, the commission has not taken a position on that bill. I don't wanna, I don't wanna be speaking on behalf of the, Sentencing Guidelines Commission to say I recommend the bill, but I do think it's it's a very interesting line of inquiry, um, and uh, I, I would be 
be happy to, to fulfill the role that, that I personally have to fill, fulfill. And as an agency, we have to fulfill uh, if, if uh, sufficiently resourced to do so on that bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, the record rights. Thank you for your time. Um, up next, we have our uh, post board uh, supplemental budget presentation. And I, and I understand that uh, Director Missile is not able to be here with us today, but we do have the very capable Mr. Mike Meehan, Assistant Director of POST. Mr. Meehan, please come forward to identify yourself and begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair members. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, I know Director Missile sent the presentation over. I'm not sure what the protocol is if you're planning on putting that up or if you want me to attempt to share my screen. I believe if you need the ability to share a screen, staff, could you please give Mr. Pehan the ability to share uh, screens and then you can put the, put the presentation up and proceed. Mr. Meehan, go ahead and try to uh, share your screen. There you go. I'm not sure, do you have that? We do. Thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, for the post up or the post budget overview, um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about our core business services so we can better understand what the budget looks like um, at the post board or the Minnesota Peace Officer Standards and Training Board. Uh, we perform all the licensing, licensing and oversight functions for between 10 and 11,000 active police officers in Minnesota. Uh, we certify and monitor the PPOE or pre-service programs at 30 colleges and universities. And that also includes maintaining uh, and establishing the pre-service learning objectives. We administer the post police officer licensing exam we review and update the content of that exam, and we work with testing professionals to ensure the valid validity and reliability of the exam. Uh, we review and either approve or deny all the continuing education courses that law enforcement agencies use to train their officers. We also ensure that those officers are receiving their statutorily mandated training or MILOs uh, that they have to complete during their renewal period. Uh, we disperse funds annually from the Philando Castillo Memorial Training Fund and the Post Board Training Appropriation Fund to reimburse law enforcement agencies for at least a portion of the cost they incur for training their officers. Uh, we also conduct compliance reviews at Fort 418 law enforcement agencies in Minnesota. And we also review and process complaints against licensees or individual officers and impose licensing san sanctions as deemed appropriate by the board. Uh, our current staffing is 15 full-time employees. Our budget is about $11.5 million. Nine of that, $9 million of that $11.5 million is pass-through money. So that money comes to post and we disperse it to uh, law enforcement agencies, again, to reimburse them for cost of their training. We have about a $2.5 million operating budget. Uh, and just a little bit of information that we've been able to gather now regarding um, what some of those training funds are being spent on. These, these figures are for fiscal year 2021. So in fiscal year 2021, law enforcement agencies spent up just over $30 million. Uh, training their officers. About 19 million of that was just general training, six and a half million use of force training, and about one and a half million dollars of emergency vehicle operations. Um, of just over 11 million dollars was spent on the mandated or MILO training. Uh, six and a half million went to use of force. Again, about 1.5 went to EVOC or emergency vehicle operations. And about 3.3 million was spent on the new or newer MILOs, uh, the conflict management, the crisis intervention, and the valuing diversity to include implicit bias training. Uh, of those kind of newer MILOs, the breakdown on the uh, uh, amount of money agencies spent training their officers on those, 
close to a million on valuing diversity to include implicit bias training, about a million on conflict management training, and just about one and a half million on crisis inter intervention, mental health, or what we call CIT training. Uh, we have made one supplemental budget request this session for 165,000 to develop a public facing database really modeled after the Board of Nursing. And that database will allow members of the public to query uh, any licensed police officer in Minnesota and view any public data that the post board holds on that license holder in real time. And with that, I will stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Members, are there any questions? Uh, Lee Johnson. Uh, Chair Frazier, uh, Mr. Meehan, one question I have on this dashboard to query all officers in the state. Um, are you going to have Minnesota statute? I can't remember which one it is. Because we have a number of officers that are on that task force and the undercover officers under Minnesota statute. I wish I, I wish I could have found it again because I, I worked under it as well when I was on an undercover narcotics officer. It is a county or the employing agency cannot disclose that that officer is employed by that jurisdiction. Um, with this database, are your uh, undercover officers going to be also excluded because under Minnesota statute, they cannot be identified? Well, the database would show public data uh, defined under Minnesota data practices, and that would certainly exclude um, personnel data or confidential data. And I believe um, the statute you refer to, um, I believe that puts uh, undercover data under confidential data. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Mann, thank you. I just uh, want to make sure it's double checked because it is a big safety issue for the officers and their families, as well as for ongoing investigations. I very much appreciate the comment, sir, and I will um, share that information with Director Masolka as well. Thank you, Lee Johnson. Mr. Me and I do I do have a couple of questions. One of the questions I I have. Um, a couple, and I, I see that we're we're coming up here now on almost a two-year anniversary of the uh, the death of, of George Floyd. I know we there's been a lot of energy and conversations around accountability and uh, transparency, and just change overall change as to how we make sure we we put a system in place that can um, you know move accountability and also in all likelihood prevent situations like that from happening in the future. And I guess my question for you is: Is it am I to be correct in understanding that um, the post board itself hasn't moved to make any independent changes around the um, around the standards and conducts um, as of yet. Is that correct? Um, I'm going to say that we are undergoing an examination and a pretty significant, I would say, proposed uh, modification to some of the post board rules six seven hundred. Um, that's been a really heavy lift over here. Um, there's a lot of people involved and a lot of community members involved in that project. And when you have that many voices coming in, it does take a lot of time. Now, very recently, the rules committee and the rules advice and the rules advisory committee. So there's two of those. Um, they have decided to expedite, uh, some of those proposed um rule modifications and move them to the board uh independently of rewriting the whole rule so not to take up too much of your time but the thought process originally at the start of that process was we we're going to rewrite all the rules or i shouldn't say that we were going to examine all the rules and propose changes and move them all at once and now they've taken the standards of conduct and a couple other rules and uh, they're expediting those. So those are moving along fairly quickly and they're 
uh, fairly close to being ready to uh, move on to the full board for their approval, but it's a long process. Um, there's public comment that still needs to happen. It still has to be, um, any new rule changes have to be, that get past the board have to be um, reviewed by an administrative law judge for constitutionality and uh, make sure they're not you know, unpromulgated rules. And so um, I guess to answer your question as directly as possible, sir, we are working hard on making some changes. Uh, and I understand there's some disappointment and frustration that maybe it hasn't happened yet, but uh, it's been a very heavy lift and we're working hard over here to get those um, through the process. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. I, I, I would say, and I think you accurately described, there is some, there is some disappointment and frustration, um, essentially looking at the fact that we're coming up here quickly upon the two-year anniversary of what spurred a lot of the conversations and energy that we're having right now. And my hope is that, uh, as, as you all are aware of that disappointment and frustration, that we can, that we can kind of pick up the pace even more and hopefully have something in place and move forward prior to the hitting this two-year anniversary. But uh, thank you. Thank you for the explanation of what, uh, what may be um, slowing down the process. I think it's also good for those that are watching um, and, and paying attention is to be aware of that, um, but not to alleviate that frustration and disappointment and hoping that we can find ways to move quicker to get something done. Uh, Mr. Meehan, uh, I see we have a couple of more questions. Uh, Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize if this has already been asked. It is difficult trying to juggle two Zooms at the same time. Uh, the question I would have is in regards to the, the database. Can uh, it be confirmed for me who is running or who will be having a purview over this? I saw an email from uh, Director Missile that, uh, that alluded to minute. So I'm just wondering, is this is the post board staff that's running this database, or is it minute that's running it, or who exactly is managing it, and then therefore who is ensuring this the the security around the database? Me in. Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. Um, so the post board will be administering the website. Um, I shouldn't say website. The public facing database, um, and it. I believe the RFP for that, we're looking for a vendor to provide that service for us, which includes um, the cybersecurity component of that. And I believe the RFP for that will post on uh, March 28th. And I hope I answered your question, sir. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And okay, so then that, yes, because uh, I think there's a lot more uh, detail that, that we need to delve into this and we may not have the opportunity right now, but this is something that's, that is certainly very important because uh, as you just mentioned, there might be a third party that might be hosting. Uh, I, I don't wanna get too geeky, but when you have a database, so the, if, if my understanding is correct, that present statute is taking the information from uh, the law enforcement agencies across the state and it's uploading that to a, a database that's housed or, or managed by post board it's still internally facing. But now under the proposed language, what it would do is, is stick a, a, a web interface in front of that database, therefore making that database now public facing instead of just internal facing. And that has an in, uh, entirely uh, new level of security that's required because when you have publicly facing uh, information, then you have to put the controls in place to ensure that you don't obviously allow people to change data, to access data beyond what was intended, et cetera. And what uh, Mr. Meehan just referenced is possibly a third party vendor, which to me sounds like a cloud possibly. Uh, so can you confirm if, if the database and the web interface will still sit on prem or is it gonna be managed by a third party up in the cloud? Mr. Meehan. I'm not sure I completely understand your question, sure. And I'm not a tech, an advanced techie person, but uh, post board, it won't be the law enforcement agencies entering the data into the public facing database. It will be the post board entering only public data into the public, only public data as defined by Minnesota statute into the public facing dashboard. And um, I can't speak to um, 
the security features or the cybersecurity features that will be included to make sure that um, uh, parties looking at that data won't be able to alter it. But um, I know that they have consulted or Director Missile has been con consulting with uh, people a lot smarter than I am uh, regarding tech issues. I do appreciate your concern about that, sir. Sorry about that, Mr. Meehan. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate that Mr. Meehan trying to answer the questions the best he can. Uh, but I will uh, be asking some more of these questions and more deep in on the House floor when this, if this provision does make it to the House floor. So I'm just hoping that the, the bill author of this provision will be able to answer some more of the technical security questions that surround protecting data. Thank you. Thank you, sir. No, I, uh, Reverend Lucero, I think those are good questions. I mean, we, we do have one of the strongest uh, data protection provisions in the country from what I understand and the work that I've done around data privacy. So we wanna make sure that we are being compliant with it and protecting the data of, uh, of, our, of our individuals. Thank you for the question. Members, any other questions? Seeing none, Mr. Mr. Meehan, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Members, up next, we have the Private Detectives Board budget supplemental presentation. And uh, to testify, we have the Executive Director, Mr. Hugo McPhee. Mr. McPhee, please uh, come forward, identify yourself, and begin your presentation. Uh, Chair Frazier, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I will share my screen if I can manage the uh, the wrinkles of technology, it should be pretty straightforward, I would think. Hopefully you see the uh, see the screen in front of you. We do. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, <laughs> uh, Hugo McPhee, I'm the uh, executive director for the Minnesota Private Detective and Protective Agent Services Regulatory Board. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it was good fortune to follow um, my uh, colleague from the post board um, uh, spot checking, uh, we, we do very similar tasks and roles, albeit I'm uh, for the private detective and private investigators uh, security uh, industry. Um, uh, in comparison, we have a budget of about $300,000 and 2.5 staff uh, for 13,000 people in the industry that we're overseeing, which is very comparable to, to the post board. So um, I just thought I would, I would share kind of a fun, uh, fun, uh, uh, factoid uh, in comparison in size and, and function. Um, so uh, uh, briefly, uh, I've got a short presentation here. Um, uh, the Minnesota Board of Private Detective and Protective Agent Services uh, was established in 1974. We've had uh, a couple, three uh, directors prior to me. I came on uh, May of 2021, so just coming uh, upon my first year here. Some of the uh, things that we do at the private detective board. Well, um, for, first and most importantly is our, our mission. Um, although we are a regulatory board, uh, a large component of what we do, I believe is uh, geared towards customer service to help those in the industry comply with statute and rules to keep community safe. And we are in fact an extension of the Department of Public Safety. So these are all very important roles that we have to um, help ensure society is, is safe. Um, our mission um, is to ensure investigative and security service practitioners meet the statutory qualifications and training for licensure, um, and also maintain the standards set forth in Minnesota statutes and, um, and rules. Some, but not all of the core functions that uh, our board uh, oversee, and our board is, uh, uh, consists of representatives from the industry as well as two public members. Uh, we oversee initial applications, which is the focus for um, uh, what I'm here for today to talk about an, an adjustment to that. Uh, we oversee and, and approve off, review officer changes, uh, application renewals, which come up every two years, complaints, uh, training certifications, which currently we have uh, 1,300 um, uh, courses that we have to review every two years. That's a very important task and role that we have um, and very difficult to get through that number in the time with the 2.5 staff. Um, we also uh, initially investigate unlicensed activity and pass uh, um, what our results are to the appropriate law enforcement jurisdiction for charging or further investigation as may be needed. Uh, follow up on various inquiries. Uh, there's a handful of research projects that we do as far as demographics, who are we serving, uh, communities underserved, those sorts of things. Um, there is a component uh, for penalties 
Uh, we handle a variety of data requests, investigative audits, it's a, a fairly fairly large list of responsibilities that um, that we have. Um, also, monthly board meetings and, and various administrative um, administrative tasks. Um, so, um, uh, 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 Chair Fraser, do you have a preference uh, which uh, component of, of the presentation you'd like to see first, either the record system uh, or the change in the um, fingerprinting uh, requirement for a new licensors license licensures? Mr. McPhee, I, I do not have a preference. Proceed as you like. Okay, th th thank you, sir. Um, uh, well, first, I'll start with um, uh, in, in the state of Minnesota uh, to become uh, licensed uh, to do any private investigatory or private security work, you need to be licensed. Um, there is a process for that uh, 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 state statute 326.3381 outlines what that process is. In comparison, um, uh, employees of license holders um, has a different statute, which um, I will compare here in, uh, in a moment. Um, prior to starting work in the private investigative field, um, uh, you have to go through an application process. And uh, in one section of the statutes, you're required to submit fingerprints to my, to my office, to my agency. Um, however, 326.3381, does not meet, and that's the, the uh, license for, uh, or I'm sorry, the statute for obtaining a license does not meet FBI standards for submission of fingerprints for a criminal history check. So the problem with that is if I uh, get my license in, um, in the industry, I can hire five people, 55 people, 555 people. Um, a statute is sufficient that my employees are done or have a uh, fingerprint check through the FBI and BCA done, um, and that that passes muster. And I, I know if uh, if somebody has a prohibited act in their background, uh, statute three twenty six three three eight one for me as a license holder does not uh, meet FBI uh, standards. So I could be from Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, not Minnesota. I'm sorry, Wisconsin, Michigan, Montana, Texas, wherever, and come to Minnesota, and nobody would know about my past criminal misdeeds, if any in these other states. And so that is a very great concern uh, to my board, uh, to me as the executive director, that we need to close that uh, loophole um, that uh, will allow um, uh, BCA staff to run the fingerprints that we're collecting anyway. We just don't have the authority to have them uh, processed in the system. And so that is essentially what um, the fingerprint-based uh, FBI query uh, uh, proposed uh, change in legislation is. Um, the cost, the cost of that is $33.25 to run an FBI check, and that is paid by the licensed applicant. So that is not a taxpayer borne uh, cost. That's not a cost uh, borne by my agency or the BCA. That is the cost uh, in addition to the application fee of $25 to have the uh, criminal history check done. And that would greatly reduce the likelihood of certain prohibited criminal offenders from attaining a Minnesota private investigator private security license, which uh, frankly is a loophole that's been in existence uh, since the statutes um, were written, uh, at least for, uh, specific to us, uh, going back uh, at least 10, 15 years or more. Is it, uh, I can pause for questions on this specific nuance or I can uh, move on to the uh, record system that will help us track this. Just uh, quickly, uh, Mr. Ms. McPhee, I have a question. Have we tried to fix this loophole in the past? Um, uh, uh, Chair Frazier, um, it, it has, my uh, staff have told me that it has come up periodically, but for whatever reason, it never um, uh, came to fruition either through committee or um, it, it, it's failed along the way um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the course of uh, the legislative process. Thank you, Ms. McPhee, proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Frazier. Um, so uh, the other part of, of the proposed legislation is a record management system. Uh, you can imagine perhaps the um, onerous uh, nature of a manual paper system, which is what uh, we currently have. We do not have an electronic system to track individuals' training, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, 13,000 uh, people who are in the industry all need at least six hours of continuing education credits every year. Um, and just managing that is, um, as you might imagine, very, very untenable. 
and the risk for errors in uh, improperly crediting somebody uh, credit for classes that they may not have taken uh, could be detrimental if they continued to operate in the industry and didn't have, for example, de-escalation training or you know um, sexual violence training or, or, or some such. Um, uh, likewise, for the license holders, um, it's uh, we have about 400, uh, slightly less than that in the industry. Uh, they are up for renewal every two years. Um, the previous slide shows the various tasks and responsibilities we have. And right now it's all done manually by um, paper, <laughs> sheets, sheets of paper, uh, spreadsheets, and um, a very, very time consuming and um, uh, a record management system, which is pretty much the industry standard. Um, so this becomes digital and electronic and easily searchable. Um, so if there are past, uh, one of the things we do when we renew licenses uh, is to see if there's any past misdeeds or past misconduct. Um, that is, is essentially a, a manual search. Uh, if this was electronic, we could pull up a, a given uh, uh, employee or uh, vendor name, a licensee name, and come up with any past history. So far less likely to make mistakes. We are human, uh, two and a half staff. It's a very uh, possible. Um, some might say likely that mistakes uh, will be made. It's inevitable. But uh, the outlay for a record manager system would uh, bring us into the 21st century. Um, and, and then some that is uh, an 80 with, uh, with minutes help in uh, uh, reviewing uh, vendors uh, in this field. Uh, it's an $80,000 initial outlay to create the system, purchase a system and create it, modify it for our needs. Um, and then there's an annual uh, licensing class, depending on how many uh, licenses we have, um, uh, would be $18,000 a year recurring. Um, but it uh, dramatically, dramatically will help improve how we uh, in, uh, interface with the industry. And um, uh, those are just some examples with training, licensing, et cetera. So uh, I, I stand for questions. I hope that was uh, clear and I, uh, I can go into more detail um, if, if somebody does have questions, but I, I, I will stand for questions if there are any. Members, any questions, members? Lee Johnson. Uh, it's here, raise your, <clears throat> Mr. McPhee. I was uh, surprised when they said just six hours of training uh, for these private detectives. That doesn't even cover any type of use of force or bias training, let alone all the other training that uh, they should be having. Um, I think it's something we need to look at to increase that. And I'm also surprised that this is a 2022 and you're still doing paper stuff on training. Uh, law, but on the law enforcement side, that's been done for decades. Uh, I, I guess I'm not sure what happened, why you end up being so far behind. I also have, was wondering when you're setting this up and doing things, we uh, heard in the post board presentation that they're going to have a public uh, place to see any complaints. There's more licensed private detectives in the state of Minnesota than there is right now working peace officers. I think we're down to just over 8,000. Uh, are you looking at any type of uh, public area where the public can look up these uh, private detective security officers, to see if there's complaints on them as well, as you like they are doing on the post board with law enforcement? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Representative Jensen, that is a very good question. Um, uh, we would be relying um, on minutes recommendations as they would be um, helping set up the system and uh, providing the um, uh, backstory for security, et cetera. Um, I envision there would be components that are uh, uh, accessible to the um, to the citizenry, such as what currently is on our website, albeit it's a, a convoluted search to to find it, but um, where we would list all um, uh, license holders, etc. I suspect discipline may or may not be um, uh, protected in some areas. I, I, I don't know enough about that. I would rely with uh, Minute and our Attorney General Rep 
Um, uh, but uh, certain aspects, I think, just for transparency, um, uh, as much as we could, should be and would be made available consistent with what Chapter 13, uh, the data restrictions would uh, limit us to. Hey, Johnson. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I, I'd say, uh, Mr. Rafi, thank you for the, the answers. But I'd say, you know, Lee Johnson, I, I have to agree with you. I think we probably have. Well, I think we, I know we have, we've neglected um, some of these boards in terms of the resources um, and time and attention that we should put into them. I know that the chair has mentioned, Chair Mariani mentioned the last time this board was before us that he's interested in looking at at least starting with this budget and investing more to ensure that we give them the resources that they need um, as they're expanding to, um, I, and, and Lee Johnson, as you noted, with a paper system <laughs> to come into the 21st century, I think that's important. Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing our boards with the resources they need to get the work done with accuracy and efficiency um, as, as much as we should be. Uh, Lee Johnson, another question. Is your hand back up or is that from last time? Yeah, it is back up. Go I, ahead, I just Johnson. wanted to, uh, I just wanted to uh, follow up with you on this. We have the post board has the programs and the everything in place already. It'd be limited costs to uh, very limited cost just to copy the programs they have and bring them over the post board. Um, so it's something may, may, may we, we may want to look at coming up in the next, either probably in the next budget cycle, but I to look and give them time to look into see what those minimal costs would be this, to grab the computer program, put it, put it up in their system and get, just make a few minor tweaks for it. Um, uh, Mr. McBee. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair Frazier. Rep uh, Representative Johnson, uh, um, prior to this undertaking, we did spend time with uh, Director Missile at the Post Board and um, talked about sharing resources, um, et cetera. Um, uh, ultimately, that did not fully come together due to um, uh, a handful of reasons, I, I suppose, on, on um, uh, their side with mixing and matching the information, uh, the data, et, et cetera, and staff assigned to do that and, and whatnot. The program that they currently are using is um, uh, the same one that we would be uh, implementing ideally if, if this is uh, comes to fruition uh, with uh, minutes input. Um, uh, and so there's there's some things that we would uh, save by, by doing that because that, that road has partially been built. Um, and um, uh, so that we did have that initial discussion, but there was not a connection with um, actually sharing the same platform per se. And, and their needs, uh, frankly, might be slightly different than some of the things that we track as well, but um, uh, duly noted, sir. Lee Johnson. Yeah, it wasn't sharing the same platform, it's just sure being able to use the same program so we don't have to rewrite a whole new program and spend millions of dollars on that when we have the program available that can be loaded up into your system into your department. Mr. McPhee, any response uh, to that? Uh, uh, sir, sir du duly noted. Um, and uh, like I say, uh, some of that roads have already been plowed. So um, I, the, uh, the cost uh, um, quoted to us by minute uh, uh, reflects uh, some of that cost savings. Thank you, Mr. McPhee. Well, I think these have been interesting conversations. Thank you, Lee Johnson, for your, your input and your questions, and especially around the potential cost savings for um, maybe duplicating what we already have uh, for efficiency's sake. I, I think that's important to note. Well, I got to tell you, these have been interesting conversations today, and I'm looking forward to continuing these conversations with all of our boards uh, as we possibly look to make take some action um, as we work out our supplemental omnibus budget this session. So. Thank you members for being here this morning. Looks like we're gonna get out here, get out of here a little bit early. You can get into your weekends and, and those that are awake can get back to your, your local jurisdiction and to your constituents for this weekend. Um, with that, if there's no other comments, I'll pause for a second. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>